Okay, so a couple of ground rules before we begin. Um, I'm going to ask that um, I'll be calling the cards in the order that I have here. Um, if you're, someone has spoken before you that gives the same information that you intend to give, you can just say something like, I agree with the gentleman from, or I agree with the person from. You don't have to keep telling us again and again the same thing. It's just help make the hearing go a little more smoothly, if possible. Um, if you have written testimony, please don't read your written testimony. Just hand that in to us and give us a synopsis of the written testimony. Okay? It'll help move things along a little better. That said, I'm going to give everybody <coughs> the opportunity to speak. And we have quite a few cards. If everybody speaks as long as they say they want to, we will be here till afternoon. I'm not real keen about that if we can help it, all right? So let's try and finish up before noon. All right. Ready? I'm ready. Call to order, it being after 10.30, I'll call to order House Bill 1114 relative to state motor vehicle inspections. And with that, I'll rep we'll call the prime sponsor, Representative Casey Conley. For the record, Representative, introduce yourself, etc. Chairman Sykes, committee members, thank you. For the record, I'm Casey Conley, State Representative from Stratford County District 13. That is uh, effectively downtown Dover and the neighborhoods directly to the north. I am here to introduce HB 1114, which would eliminate the mandatory safety inspection uh, on non-commercial motor vehicles while preserving the annual inspection checks. Members on this committee, uh, here for any period of time, I've seen inspection bills like this come through. In the past, uh, this one tried to address some of the concerns that were raised during past attempts. Uh, for instance, it maintains the existing inspection provisions for commercial vehicles. The reason being these vehicles are on the roads uh, often all day, every day, for as many as 250 days a year. Given their size, it makes sense they be checked routinely. Secondly, as I said, it maintains the emissions component of the existing statute. And it does so for two reasons. First and foremost, uh, there are potential federal funding ramifications if this were to be eliminated. Secondly, no matter how one feels about climate change, we can all probably agree we benefit from vehicles that are running at their optimum uh, condition and pollute as little as possible. The commercial activity piece is also some <coughs> something I wanted to address briefly. The bill uses the language, and I'm, I'm going to quote directly from the bill, uh, commercial activity is defined as in the course of regular business. So what does this mean? It's a bit of legalese that essentially is meant to cover vehicles uh, that are routine, routinely used for business purposes. This isn't um, if I lend my friend my pickup truck uh, to help them move and he gives me 20 bucks, that's not in the routine course of business. Uh, likewise, if I you know, pick up a load of lumber at Home Depot and someone gives me a six pack of beer, that's not, again, a commercial endeavor. Uh, but it is meant to cover Uber and Lyft um, and vehicles that are personal vehicles that are used in the course of business. Uh, so all that said, um, I wanted to share a little bit of data on inspections in general. The inspection process, as the committee knows, is fairly well ingrained by now. Premise being that motorists bring their vehicles in once a year to make sure they're safe for road use. And taking that premise a step further, it adds a degree of comfort that other vehicles on the road, traveled by your friends and your family uh, and yourself, uh, are reasonably safe. And that is the crux of why I filed this bill. I do not think motor vehicle inspections make a meaningful difference in road safety. I do not believe they should be mandatory, and I can share some data to help illustrate that point. First, 34 states do not have any safety inspections whatsoever. These states include uh, those with similar climates to New Hampshire, that's Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Places like Colorado, Montana, and Alaska, which have similarly difficult freeze-thaw cycles, which can really decimate the roads. And it includes places like Utah, Michigan, and Iowa that salt their roads and highways. And salt being a corrosive that damages roads, we all know what that does. It's not just New Hampshire and New England that 
uh, that does this practice. Depending on the year and the method used, Minnesota, Washington, and Ohio are typically ranked among the safest states in the U.S. for motorists. Again, no inspection in these states. Yet Texas, Louisiana, and Virginia, all of which have a safety inspection, rank in the middle of the pack or lower for safety. The Insurance Information Institute looked at all 52,274 drivers involved in 34,500 fatal crashes in 2017. So that, for those numbers, you know, that's the, the thinking that sometimes there's two, crack, two vehicles involved, sometimes there's not. That's why those numbers don't line up exactly as you might expect. The Institute found that the top five factors attributed to fatal accidents were in this order, driving too fast, which this committee has heard already this year with a separate bill, um, operating under the influence, failure to maintain the proper lane, failure to yield, and distracted driving. All told, those five account for 48% of all fatal crashes. The III data, that's the Insurance Information Institute, does not even explore component failure in its study. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has studied the effect of component failure in more than 2.1 million crashes that occurred between 2005 and 2007. It found in a study released in 2015 that compo component failures were responsible for 2% of all crashes, 2%. Of those, more than a third stemmed from tire failures, which we know can happen regardless of the age or the condition of the tire. Driver behavior accounted for 94% of all those 2.1 million crashes. Driver behavior. Inspections for all the comfort they offer represent a snapshot in time. They demonstrate that a certain vehicle on a certain date met the inspection criteria according to one shop. Yet inspections last for 12 months and in some cases up to 16 months, during which time a motorist could drive 8,000 miles or 40,000 miles. Or it, could, it really could be any number. Um, and yet the inspection doesn't change regardless of miles driven, condition of the vehicle within that period and so on. Despite a scarcity of data, we know that one in five, and as many as half, fail inspections each year. That means for weeks or months, thousands of vehicles that, are, that would not pass an inspection are traveling on our roads with you and I without problem. And yet, New Hampshire ranks in the top 10 or 12 for road safety every year. Again, just considering different metrics. Another note to consider, New Hampshire in no way limits vehicles from other states that do not require inspection from traveling our roads, coming in during peak summer, summer tourist season, safe to think that there would be thousands of these uninspected vehicles traveling our roads. I'm no mechanic. I have no idea what's going on with my car at any given time, and really, I don't want to know. Um, but neither are the 30, you know, there's not, in these 34 other states that do not have inspection, most people aren't mechanics. And yet, as we know from the data, states without inspections are just as safe or safer than New Hampshire. The key point here is that <coughs> inspections don't have value. The point is that the data, uh, is that there is limited data to prove specifically that inspections improve safety to the point they should be mandatory. The connection is tenuous at best. Inspections hit lower income residents the hardest, and operating on an expired ex inspection sticker is one of the most common citations issued statewide, leading to fines and other sanctions. There's broad agreement modern cars are safer than they've been, than they've ever been. They're loaded with sensors to track performance and potential problems. <coughs> and meanwhile, the emissions component of the law, which would remain in effect, could potentially identify serious drivetrain problems with the inspection. I'll end this, Mr. Chairman, by saying I trust New Hampshire drivers to care for their vehicles, just like the roughly 2 million other U.S. residents in states without inspections. If this passed, I expect many will continue to have their cars checked annually to ensure their safety. The key difference would be those checks would be voluntary. With that, I will take questions if there are any. Uh, thank you, Representative, for taking my question. I find your statistics very interesting, and today we're living in a world of recalls with vehicles. Now, I do know in my past experience, whenever I go get my vehicle inspected, 
they have, they bring up the uh, manufacturer and they re-notify me if I, you know, slip my mind of potential recalls. And I think that is a, a number that is severely missing in what your facts are, because I do remember the Ford Pinto, and it was statistical information of rear end uh, in the 70s, rear end uh, crashes that caused fires and fatality, uh, fatalities. So with these 34 states and now us joining it, I mean, I see a risk factor. I just want you to, you know, what your thoughts are with that. Because recalls, you don't get it done, you're creating a risk factor for our, our operators here. Thank you, Representative, for the question. So uh, as someone who uh, seems like all of our new vehicles have had some recall or another that we have addressed in the exact same mode you've described, um, you, under this bill, you would still go in for an annual inspection. It would just be the emissions component. So presumably, you could still address that at the same time as you would now. Follow up, if I may. Follow up. Is that, I don't want to get hung up, but on the legal aspect, the way I read the bill, if I go in for emissions, is he have the full authority to look for something else? Because he wouldn't. I mean, uh, would he look at the ball joints if he's, if I'm just going in for uh, an OBT2 test? Thank you, Representative. I have no idea what occurs when I bring my car to the dealer and they inspect it. Uh, I have no idea what uh, triggers the, that they would even know that there's a recall. I don't know that the inspection itself, uh, if the item is unrelated to an inspectable area, is what triggers it. Or if it's the fact that you're bringing it in and they're saying, hey, this vehicle has a recall. Let's see if it's been done. Thank you. I have Representative Ferozier next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative, for taking the question. So, if this were to become law, you still have to bring your vehicle into presumably a service station to have your OBD test done. So, there's nothing to prevent that station from doing an emergency inspection of the vehicle while it's there. But would that be true? Thank you, Representative. That's correct. And um, if the inspections are as valuable as, as some believe, then I would presume that. Um, entrepreneurial service stations would then offer a product that they could then sell voluntarily to people voluntarily. Thank you. Representative Clyde Knight. Uh, would you believe, thank you Mr. Chair, would you believe that uh, Representative O'Brien touched on a point that actually saved my husband's life and if the ball bearings hadn't been checked he would have kept driving. He commutes every day to Woburn, Massachusetts and he had a potential loss for that connection to just go off. But so I'm really, I'm glad that they do look for that. And I guess my question leading up to that is, if you said you could go to a private shop and have somebody else look at everything, if this, is a, if this were to pass and we only inspect emissions. But I have a concern that if only a limited number of shops are being trained to look for certain things, the, there's going to be a major decline in educating our so question coming would you do you believe that there will be an education decline in these mechanics looking for certain things if they're not going to bother with being trained maybe to check and only check emissions representative thank you to the first uh, part of that comment um, I would just point out that drivers in other states have ball joints that have potential problems that uh, are not caught during inspection and we are not, and as we know, there are 2% of incidents, uh, crashes, are component failure. Uh, to your second part, I trust mechanics in our state to know the vehicles they service, regardless of uh, what brings the car into the shop. Um, follow-up? Yeah, follow-up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for taking my follow-up, Representative. Do you have any figures showing um, a, a decrease in crash data or any... Um, crash data involving when these states start, stopped checking for these things to see if their numbers of crash data involving that 2% actually declined or went up? Thank you, I don't have that. So historically, uh, most states had safety inspections. Uh, in our state, I believe it used to be twice a year. And I imagine there was similar level of concern when it went from twice a year to annually. Um, crash data, um, crashes are on the rise and uh, nationally, if you look at the figures. They're not on the rise due to component failure, they're predominantly on the rise due to increases in driving under the influence and distracted driving. <coughs> One more. 
Uh, do you, do you know, I have two. They're really good, trust me. How much do you know if our, if at any of our insurance rates will go up in New Hampshire? If we decide to get, start asking things from our inspection services? Representative, I have no way of knowing what insurance companies use to come up with their rates. I would assume that they would um, look at all the data available to them but when they issue those rates. And can you confirm if we won't receive a potential loss in federal funds if we start tampering with our uh, inspection process? Representative, the reason the bill is crafted in the current form is precisely to avoid that potential. Were we to get rid of the emissions component, that would be a potential risk. Therefore, that is still in the bill for other reasons as well. Thank you. Further questions? Representative Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for taking my question. <clears throat> Anybody that's been on this committee long enough has done a lot of research on this topic. Of the 34 states that don't have annual inspection bills, what other means does law enforcement have to get unsafe vehicles off the road? For example, roadside inspections. That exists, your representative, thank you. That uh, opportunity for law enforcement to interact with unsafe vehicles exists in other states. And I should point out that it's a patchwork. I mean, every state, many states are similar to ours, but many are a little different. Connecticut, for instance, doesn't require an annual one, but they have, if you move there from out of state and so on, other states are like that. Um, so that exists in some states uh, as a means of getting unsafe vehicles off the road. That exists in our state in, in some ways, independent from our inspection statutes. There are some safety uh, requirements codified in statute rather than rules that would give law enforcement the authority to uh, act in the event they see an unsafe vehicle. Representative Tripp. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, interesting bill. Um, I think one of the uh, major uh, arguments against the bill might be, that, well, who's gonna, uh, who's gonna check the brakes? Who's gonna check the brakes? Um, with that argument in mind, do you have any idea how the 34 states that uh, don't have vehicle inspections, how do they, or are they not concerned with the condition of the brakes? Representative, thank you. I uh, I can't speak to writ large what these states do. I just I just know looking at the fact that they don't have inspections that they must trust the people in their states to take care of their own vehicles in due time. Thank you. Representative Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you again, Representative. Are you aware that many manufacturers uh, in this state and other states, if you bring your vehicle for an oil change? <coughs> they will automatically do an inspection check and give you a sheet, including checking brakes and, and other safety components. Are you aware of that? Thank you, Representative. My car is telling me it's due for service now. Uh, <laughs> and when I bring it in, I will get a yellow or a white piece of paper with an indication of my tires and other aspects of the vehicle. So yes, uh, some manufacturers, I have a Toyota, some do. I don't know what other vehicles. Thank you. Representative Watt. Thanks, Mr. Chair. One last one for me. I thought I heard you say, correct me if I'm wrong, that because these vehicles still have to go for their OBD2 test, you think it would be okay if the mechanic discovered that the ball joints were hanging out of it, that that person could just drive off? Um, so I don't even know what a ball joint is, to be honest with you, but um, I mean, I can, I can deduce from what, um, but I think in the event that someone has an unsafe vehicle, the same ha would happen now if I'm in between my inspection. Um, I, I don't know what the recourse would be, but there are times in between inspections when that exact scenario must occur in our state. Um, and presumably, they alert the driver that there's a very serious safety risk and that they should do it. Beyond that, I don't know what more they could do. Follow up? It <laughs> goes directly yeah, go, to his go for it. Go for it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, currently what they can do is a mechanic, uh, a license inspection station, if they do find something that is broken to that point, such as ball joints hanging out of it, they can take the vehicle off the road until it is fixed. So without this, did I, did I get a question in there? Did you believe? Did you believe? <laughs> that well, right now they have the ability to take the vehicle off the road if they find a serious safety infraction. And without this, that ability would be gone. 
Representative, I would believe that. I would also believe, again, just knowing, looking at the data, and not, I mean, there's anecdotal evidence for days about everyone who knows someone who this has happened to or a scenario one could envision, but then you look at the data showing that component failures writ large are just not causing accidents. So I'm sure there are, and we know at 2% there are, which is in 2.1 million, it's 44,000 crashes, not a small number. Um, but also not the, the key driver in motor vehicle crashes, so. Representative Conley, did you, you have handouts that you were giving to us, the data that you've been? I, Representative, thank you. I'm happy to share all of that by the end of the day. And one final point, if I may, there is an amendment coming that is not, uh, not yet finished. What the amendment would do in the event that someone, I'll be um, on a tugboat in Puget Sound when this uh, is exact, but um, in the event that someone were to introduce it, it would not eliminate the safety inspection altogether. It would make this every two years. So that's for the committee to consider. Uh, and when the amendment is ready, I will make sure everyone gets it. Uh, one, one question that I have. So I'd like you to elaborate for me, if you would, you point out to us that other states without inspections have better safety records. The question I have in my mind is, is the quote unquote measurement of these safety records consistent throughout the 50 states and what is the criteria that they use? Thank you. So the two foremost criteria, the ones that I looked at were fatal crashes per capita and fatal crashes per 100,000 miles traveled. Um, and that's why I sort of said, depending on the metric and the data is somehow between sites sometimes doesn't align 100% uh, or between sources. So two of the, among the safest states are inspection states, Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Uh, among the other safest, among those top five, Minnesota and Wisconsin. So. Looking at that criteria, it just suggests that there isn't a causal link between inspection and safety. So I'm going to give myself a follow-up. Okay. Is there any data that makes the, the connection between non-fatal crashes and, and inspection states and non-inspection states? Because, or is it, to rephrase it, is there data that suggests that component failures do not necessarily lead to fatal crashes, <coughs> but lead to crashes? Right, and that's... Uh, that's, that, that's the piece that I see missing. You're, you're correct that that data is missing. Uh, the closest we could get is the, um, I believe it's the NHTSA study, which I will share with the committee, that looked at 2.5, well, over two and a half years, 2.1 million crashes where the data was available. And so some of those were presumably fatal, some were presumably not, and that was the result that came. But that particular data point is hard to come by and you are correct to identify it. It's potentially problematic. <laughs> okay, thank you, Representative. I think we'll, we'll hear from some experts now and then we'll, we'll see you know, what, we, what further we can learn. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, so <coughs> just Okay, yeah, no, no problem. Um in no particular order I just shuffled the cards so don't feel offended if you don't get called first, second or third or whatever. But again I repeat, if you're offering data or offering uh, opinions, let's just not keep repeating. So Mr. Goulet? You won the lottery. You got to be first in terms of your cohort. Hey, uh, Don Goulet, I did in Manchester, New Hampshire. Okay, thank you. Where are you from, Mr. Goulet? Uh, 100 Brady Circle, New Hampshire, New Hampshire. Thank you. I'm sorry I mispronounced your name. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. All right, so uh, being a AAA, uh, I, I own a service garage in Manchester, a diner too. And we also serve uh, our AAA service garage. So we have uh, very many vehicles towed into our shop on a regular basis. Uh, 
uh, and aside from mechanical breakdowns as far as not the engine not running or the transmission failures, we see quite a few where tie rods are broken, ball joints have separated and the wheels have gone up through the fender, uh, springs that fall out of uh, cars, uh, and uh, so there, and uh, many of these cars are have been inspected in the past, and they're just casualties of you know continued driving, potholes, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, the other thing that uh, I'd like to say is that a lot of these items, if if we stop doing state inspections, uh, I see that people do not do repairs on their own. Uh, uh, not a majority, but there's several, unless they have to have the work done for inspection. Uh, common phrase I hear during the oil change or something else, uh, your car needs brakes. I don't have the money for that right now. I'll take care of it when I get my inspection done. And down the road they go. Uh, so I think without the stick to make people uh, repair their cars, they're not going to do it. Uh, a lot of people, when money's an issue, Time's an issue, I can't leave the car, I need to go to work, school, whatever. Uh, I just had this past week, a gentleman that came in, his car failed for his wiper blades. The rubber portion of the blades were shredding off and flapping off his wiper blades. And then he proceeded to ask me if he needed those for inspection. And I said, yeah, you do. And he said, okay, he says, I have a pair at home. I'll go home and put them on. And it's like, you know, how long are you going to drive with a, a new pair of wiper blades at home and, and, and not be able to see out of your windows when it's raining? Uh, and and uh, something that was mentioned before is I do believe that technicians who don't go through the safety testing procedure are not going to be able to not uh, notice as well as those who are trained potential safety problems. Uh, as a representative uh, testified earlier, he doesn't know what a ball joint is. He doesn't know what a lot of parts on cars are. And that's true of most people who just drive and go back and forth to work. It's, it's nothing wrong with it. And a lot of customers that we bring out and show them stuff that's wrong in their car, they don't understand the safety aspect of it until we can actually demonstrate to them when they're looking at the breakdown of their car, what's <coughs> going to happen when this piece breaks or fails. And only then is when it becomes apparent that, you know, geez, my life could be in danger. Uh, so uh, that's, I, I guess, pretty much the crux of it. There's other things that have already been brought up in the question. Thank you, sir. Will we take questions? Yes. I am representing St. Clair first. Thank you, and I, I will have a follow-up to the chair. Um, when you have people come in just for general service, do you take the time to just give a once over for other uh, potential issues that they may or may not be aware of? Uh, we ask customers if it's something they'd like us to do. We don't just routinely do it. Okay. And my follow up is you mentioned that some people have had bad breaks and uh, they said, well, I'll catch it when I have to get my inspection. I uh, heard representatives say earlier that you have apparently have the right to say, no, nope, you can't take that car out of here, you've got bad brakes. Is that something you've never done? Uh, no, but we actually don't have the right to stop anybody from taking their car. At that point, the only thing we can do would be to call the police and notify them of a potential safety hazard that somebody is driving a car. And depending on how fast they could respond or whatever, I have no right to, to, to hold anybody in custody until the cops show up. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir, for taking the question. I'm going to have a follow-up to Mr. Chair. Uh, you had mentioned that um, you have vehicles come in that engines are not running properly, transmission issues, and so forth. And when they're ready, you see uh, springs, ball joints, etc. Do you have statistics? Do you have numbers of, of you know, just once, twice, ten times? Do you have some kind of numbers to support? I don't have statistics, and it's not that I see problems with cars that come in with a broken transmission. It's the other way around. They get towed in with the springs hanging out and stuff like that. Uh, it's probably once every couple of weeks the car gets towed in with a, something that breaks on your steering or suspension. Follow up. Follow up. Another representative asked um, earlier um, about ball joints hanging out. 
in, in recourse. I heard you say that you don't have recourse, but if you had a vehicle come in that had very loose ball joints, and I do know what they are, that are they're well past tolerance, you have a moral obligation to let state police or somebody know on that if, if you believe the car is coming back out on the road. Yeah, I just, I've, I've actually called, notified police in the past for cars that I didn't feel should even be driven around the building, never mind around on the streets. Thank you. Representative O'Brien. Yeah, uh, to follow up to the previous testimony and everything, I'll give you another mechanical issue, but part of your inspections, you'll look at the uh, CV boot on a vehicle, and you can notice that the boot is torn. And can you just explain, and you're going through, what would happen if you didn't replace, if all the dirt and everything got into the CV joint on the vehicle? Uh, it would eventually, the dirt would damage the joint beyond, uh, you know, just repairing the boot versus replacing the whole shaft. So it, it would save money. So uh, follow up if I may. Just quickly, by the annual inspection, somebody could save very expensive automobile repairs by just getting a car inspected annually. You yeah. would notice that in part of the inspection that the, the boot is torn. That's, that's actually part of the process of the state inspection that uh, the state uh, safety department tells us to interact with the customers and let them know your brakes are are worn and also your ball joint has some play in it it's okay right now it passes right. inspection but you may want to keep an eye on it you might need it before next inspection okay. true thank you mr chair i do not have a follow-up <coughs> I like that. <laughs> um, the bill is written, does away with the safety inspection. Um, and uh, uh, so brakes would be a major safety issue that you, you would normally catch in the safety inspection. Um, uh, I'm not looking for uh, things that would cause the car to break down. That's not really safety. But like, what are two other major safety issues that a driver may not be aware of. Right? I mean, I'd be aware of my wheel has so much play in it. But what are the safety issues, the top two, would you say, that uh, that a owner would not be aware of that could seriously cause problems down the road? Yeah, I would say that steering and brakes are the two biggest things. And in some cases, you don't feel anything in your steering when you could still have something that's ready to fail. It's not something you may necessarily notice. All right. And can I just add two more things? Certainly, um, sir. Just to be, I mean, the, the cost of this state inspection, whether we do emissions or just safety alone, would not change. Uh, so there wouldn't be any savings to the consumer. It still takes about the same amount of time. Um, and the other thing is if we were to do just emission testing and not safety, more than likely, the car would never even be picked up in the air because all we do is plug in under the dash. So it would be a much, uh, you know, a, a, an item you could do without having to put it on the lift. So there would be some, some risk that you're not going to see anything in the air because you're not lifting the car anymore. Thank you. Yes, Representative. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Only because I think I previously misspoke. This did happen to me when I was running an inspection shop. Just to be clear. If a customer were to come into your garage and you found both inside brake pad plates, <coughs> inside the cooling fins of the rotors grinding away, um, the, the only thing we could do would be to inform the customer that you were about to call the Department of Safety and strongly recommend that that car is not driven. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Thanks. Yes, I'm going to withdraw my testimony for now. I think my uh, my subject will be covered later. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Christopher White. <coughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Christopher White. I'm from Plymouth, New Hampshire. I'm representing my dealership, which I work at, which is Plymouth Ford. 
And uh, first, I'd like to speak to you with my Plymouth Ford hat on and describe what we see on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, quickly touch upon the speed at which vehicles can fail. So because of our considered extreme climate, 100 degree days in the summer, freezing cold in the winter, we have frost heaves, uh, we have roads that are rough enough to damage a vehicle under 7,000 miles worth of age. Uh, our vehicles that come in to us are both new and used, and we are at the point where we're recommending alignments at 7,500 miles. Uh, that's a manufacturer recommendation because of the fact that the suspensions can move that much. And what happens when you need an alignment is it is set up to drive perfectly straight ahead. And after driving our roads, the suspension actually flexes and strains to a point where the wheels don't point straight anymore. <coughs> so if you're talking about being safe going down the road and the deciphering between who's going to drive 6,000 miles and 40,000 miles, some of my customers that do drive 30 or 40,000 miles a year have the potential to need up to three or four alignments per year. And you're also talking about the stress on those components that are causing that much movement. Uh, eventually results in a loose component. Uh, we're not talking about brake pads that are failing because they're inadequate stopping power all the time. The state minimum for passenger vehicles is two millimeters worth of brake friction material remaining, and on commercial vehicles is four millimeters. And I just want to pass these around. This is your commercial vehicle, and this is your passenger vehicle. Two millimeters is next to nothing, and they start off approximately 10 to 12 millimeters when they're new. Uh, and a cost of ownership with your investment, vehicles are typically your second largest investment you make in your entire life. Uh, at the dealership level, we give you, every time you come in, a multi-point inspection, and we consider that a vehicle health report because it can cause serious issues if you don't pay attention to it. It's just like going to your doctor. And uh, when you're talking about your vehicle health report, every time I see you for your oil change, which if you're driving 20,000 miles a year, I should see you four times. You have four opportunities for me to tell you that you do have something wrong with your vehicle that won't pass state inspection, that may be a safety issue, and you can also budget for that safety item in that time frame. You can also do your state inspection up to four months early, which would result in you another opportunity to budget for repairs. If you did your state inspection early, you wouldn't have to wait till the last minute and only have 30 days or less to save up for that repair. Um, and then some of the items that we see that I would consider safety issues, uh, we don't have a lot of street lights up in Plymouth and northward. Uh, your headlights do have to operate, your taillights have to operate. And if your lights aren't working, if you've ever come up on a deer real fast, imagine coming up on a vehicle really fast with no lights on. Uh, yes, there's reflectors, but the lights play a bigger role than just an indicator during the day. At nighttime, it's a significant safety concern. Uh, now we're talking about uh, the difference between commercial and pers personal vehicles. I don't believe there's a good way to decipher that. You might have a lift customer or a landscaper that could drive 10,000 miles a year. Uh, but I might have a customer of mine who drives a pickup truck 50,000 miles a year that's not considered a commercial vehicle. And that time frame for them to go two years, that means I'm not going to see them for almost 100,000 miles for state inspection. And I believe there's far too much that can happen to a vehicle in that time frame that could be damaging. And then uh, one last thing uh, with the systematic approach for technicians, I do agree with Mr. Goulet. I believe that the technician looking over the vehicle on a multi-point inspection is very similar to a state inspection, but when you're talking about the idiosyncrasies, even manufacturer specific, if you go to a Kia dealership with your Kia, and you go to a Ford dealership with your Kia, there may be something that the Ford technician's not gonna pick up on, nobody's perfect, but if everybody's doing the state inspection the same way for safety, uh, it gives you that much better of an insight onto how your vehicle is going to be performing. And uh, next hat is my my family hat. I have two young boys that drive around in a pickup truck with my wife each day, and uh, 
they drive rough roads. She does. She bought the vehicle in November, and she already has 10,000 miles on it. She's all over the place. Uh, yes, I want to maintain her vehicle. Uh, I want to make sure it's in good operating condition. But the things that I see on a day-to-day -day basis, I drive around and I see a brake pad on the side of the road now that the snow is melting. That means that someone stopped, ignored the fact that they had four brakes, and the brake pad exited their vehicle, bounced along the road, and ended up on the side of the road. So this is also something that would have bounced along and hit the windshield of my car. Uh, you look at Jessica's law with having snow coming off the top of your roof. Imagine having a three or four pound <coughs> spring off of a leaf spring break off, which is basically a flat piece of steel that we see frequently break. Uh, and also a potential of a brake pad, which I said they're only, the friction material is only two millimeters thick when it's failing, but a brake pad's typically probably six inches across, and it's, it's steel, it's heavy. It could go through your windshield without a problem. And that's something that I worry about when I talk about safety concerns, is who's driving around on the road with me that could potentially leave something in the road for me to hit, or have something come off of their vehicle that could damage my vehicle. To take questions? Sir? Yes. Representative Klein, uh, Thanks, Chair. It, can you give us a guess how many inspections your shop conducts in a year? Um, pretty sure we, we're, we're not a, a large dealership, but um, we inspect every vehicle that we sell, and we average about 70 cars a month that we sell. And then, in addition to that, customers that are coming in, we're probably closer to 100 inspections of customers coming in. So close to 200 inspections a month. Okay. Follow-up Sure. Thank you, Jack. Of those 200 a month, can you hazard a guess how many put things off until inspection or have trouble paying for, for repairs? I have a very loyal customer base and I, I find that when in need people do find a way to pay for their repairs. Uh, there is the hardship clause with the state for the emissions portion of it, uh, not the safety portion, but I can tell you that for instance Ford, Volkswagen offer 0% financing for repairs when you apply for their credit card for up to 12 months and a lot of our customers will opt for something like that or have to take out a credit card. Cars aren't easy to maintain or inexpensive. I agree with that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to take another crack at that. Okay. I, what I'm trying to figure out is of those monthly inspections, mm -hmm. how many people may have a hard time paying and if this were to pass, would it, this would embolden them to put off safety repairs. I, I don't believe a major I believe a small minority of my customers have trouble paying for okay. their repairs and there's always another option if they need it. Thank you. Representative Tarosian, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir, for taking the question. I currently drive a one of my vehicles is a Ford and I bring it to the so it happens to be the largest dealership in this region. And when they do they always do an inspection, whether it's an oil change or whatever I may be in for. And I guess this is a question of curiosity. We go a Ford dealer. When they when they goes in, they go right down and sever them, brakes, ball joints, tires, the whole nine yards. It, it, it's, it's actually more thorough than the in inspection sticker I get. So, is that something that's a standard with, with Ford, or is it vary from dealer to dealer? It, it varies from dealer to dealer. How specific it may be, uh, and then every independent repair facility has their own way of going about it. So there's no fixed set of ways to go about that. There's one quick follow-up, Mr. Chair. Yes. If you were in the room, you may have heard testimony from the crime response on the building. Out of the four safest states, two of the four are non-inspection states and they have similar climate as <coughs> we have. We do have an opinion on why those states let stickers seem to be able to do as safely as states to that. Um, I don't believe when I was hearing those statistics that they incorporated just New Hampshire vehicles. I could be wrong, but I think that you're incorporating a huge amount of populace that comes in here on vacation that may be incorporated in that. Uh, 
Can I, can I take, take another stab at yeah. that? Sure. Yeah. So the, the question was, based on the, the early testimony, was that the, the, the top four safest states mm -hmm. for our vehicle uh, safety is concerned, two of those four were non-inspection states. Mm -hmm. So the, the question was, if you had an opinion as to why those states seem to be having the same high level of safety that we have in New Hampshire. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Okay. Um, Representative True. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> Thank you for taking my question. <coughs> Did you tell us uh, how long it takes you to do a safety inspection and what it costs your company to do a safety inspection? Uh, my, I can tell you that when I took my state inspection exam, it took me a full hour to demonstrate to a, a state trooper how to perform a state inspection. Typically, it is within 45 minutes to an hour's time frame to perform safety and emissions state inspection. Uh, the cost that we have is we pay our technician an hour's worth of time, which at their going rate can range between 20 and $25. Uh, but the stickers cost us money to purchase. It's a very small profit margin in the actual performing of the state inspection. Okay, thank you, sir. <coughs> I don't, I can't read the first name, but uh, is it Mr. Young or Ms. Young? Mr. Young. True. No, your handwriting, sir. It's is terrible, challenging. isn't it? <laughs> challenging <laughs> <magic word. laughs> um, Try to cover a new point, sir. If you I, I will do that, which will shorten up my testimony. So, thank you. Um, the first thing I'll touch on is I, I, I represent, or I work at Merchants Automotive in Hooks, New Hampshire. Um, we sell about 300 vehicles a month. Uh, so therefore around 3,000 or so a year. Um, every one of those that we sell has a state inspection sticker on it. It passes state inspection. If you repeal the law, the safety inspection law, then my company or any other company has no reason to do a state inspection on a vehicle and put a sticker on it before it goes out the door unless it passes emissions by the bill, I believe. So at that point, you're putting vehicles on the road, depending on the, on the company, Okay, because the company incurs expenses to make that vehicle pass inspection. So the majority of our vehicles we buy at auction or private sale or our trade-ins. Right now I have to repair those vehicles so they pass state inspection before I can even drive the vehicle on the road to test drive it and make sure everything else works properly. If you repeal the law, I don't have to do that. I can make sure it passes OBD. I can put that emission sticker on it and drive it down the road, which is likely the way a lot of vehicles will get sold. I'm not telling my dealership will do it, but a lot of places will. So I, if the way I understand the bill, that would no longer be a responsibility of the dealership or anyone selling the car to make sure it passes inspection. I think that's an issue for people who are buying vehicles to think about. Um, I believe, as was mentioned before, but I'll take it a little bit further, um, there was something mentioned about warning devices telling you about things going wrong with your car. That's true, there are a lot of lights that come on on cars, and a lot of cars come into our dealerships. We, I mentioned about how many cars we sell. I service about 1,000 cars that are non-merchants uh, owned vehicles, so about 1,000 customer cars a month. A lot of cars come in with warning lights on. And when we do our normal services, and we do the safety, the, the, uh, the multi-point inspection, if, if indeed we're allowed to, because we have to ask, is it okay if we do this check? Most people opt for it. A lot of people will say, I don't wanna know. But you, hey, your check engine lights on, your tire pressure lights on, I don't care, it's running okay, put it down the road. Or if indeed, as was mentioned before, the state inspection item, they'll have us look at it. Um, one of the last things I wanna talk about is what <coughs> the limits are or what the standards are. New Hampshire has some pretty good standards, and I say that from both a personal standpoint and a professional standpoint that we have a very good outline of what I as a safety inspector need to look at and what I can tell you as a consumer <coughs> fails or doesn't fail. 
There are quite a few states that have state inspection laws that it's totally up to the inspector as to what is or isn't safe. So, for instance, I can sell a vehicle to someone in Massachusetts, like, or New York, stands out in my mind. It passes New Hampshire state inspection. It goes there, and I get a call from the consumer saying, gee, the car doesn't pass New York state inspection. Why is that? They say the brakes are no good. I go to my records, I look at it. Now, our, our rule when we sell the car is four to five, 30 seconds, or four to five, 30 seconds of brake pad. So it's twice the legal limit or more before we sell the car. Up to Jimmy, at, and I'm just making up names here, Jimmy at Luke's Automotive in Schenectady says, yep, he says that's not enough. So it doesn't pass New York State inspection. There is no rule. So now if you do that, and my, my recourse to the customer now is, when they say to me, does it pass inspection, I can firmly say, yes, it does. Or if I'm looking at your car, I can say, no, it doesn't, based on the state limits. If you take away the inspection rules or the law and saying you don't have to get inspected, now you're gonna be varying across, I think, the people that we're trying to save money to, that now it's totally up to the inspector to say, it's not safe. So there's no law there, there's no rule. Um, and I'll just go to the point that the, the sponsor made, which is now you push that up to two years and there's still a rule. Not to regurgitate it, but you put a lot of mileage on and a lot of things happen in the course of two years. So that's just something to think about. But those are the highlights of things I need to talk about that are new and that's what I got. Thank you, sir. Uh, Representative Tarosian. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, sir, for taking the question. Yes. So, <coughs> help me understand, um, you're in the business of selling used cars, mm -hmm. and most people know if you buy a used car from the deal, you typically pay more than a private sale. And I know, I see in marketing all the time that deals talk about doing a multi-point inspection mm -hmm. as part of the car. Yeah. That seems like it makes sense from a marketing point of view. Do I understand you correctly? If, if the inspection sticker went away, you, you, you would just sell a car as is? You wouldn't? I, I can't say that we would. Okay, I don't own the dealership. I'm just saying that the opportunity is there for dealerships <coughs> to do that. Because part of my responsibility for a 20-day plate on that vehicle is it has to pass New Hampshire State Inspection. So if indeed you do away with the rule, I think you also have some other legislature that has to follow because now there's, there's verbiage in <coughs> as a dealer issuing 20-day plates that before I put that plate on, it has to pass New Hampshire State Inspection. So if indeed you take away the reason that I have to put I have to put a sticker on the car, okay? So I'm just saying that when I look at that, some dealers may, some dealers might not, and certainly from a standpoint of the consumer, I think that there's a question of <coughs> the vehicle. Is a very quick follow-up. Follow-up. Okay. Thank you. So in regards to the woman we're on the state, and in regard to understanding that some dealers do do a multi-point inspection, the safety sticker aside, does yeah. your, your dealership do a multi-point or a certified used car type. Yes, we do. Yeah. is next. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. I live about a half mile, I'm from Manchester, live about a half mile from this auction site on Bypass 28, which mm -hmm. I imagine merchants go there to buy some vehicles. We, we actually don't, but I know the place. Yes. Okay, follow up. Uh, those cars that are sold, Many times to individuals, from what I can see, them driving out of lot. Uh, are those sold as is? I, again, I can't speak for that auction specifically because I don't know it specifically. I can tell you what I have heard about that specific auction, mm -hmm. and many of those vehicles are sold as is. So the onus is purely on the buyer at that point as what happens. And as if I may to follow up on that, I'm also here that many of those vehicles leave that place with what's called a screwdriver registration where the plate just gets screwed on it and out the door it goes and who knows what goes on. Thank you. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll cut it. No, we don't have to wait. Um, Mr. Weave, Dan Weave. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning. I come with a different perspective on this. Uh, the, the father in me, the grandfather, the husband says this is really not a good idea. Uh, the, the business side of me says let's go for this. Uh, as we have it, the 
legislation put before us is here to purportedly save us money. We all know that in our everyday lives, we go to the doctor to get a checkup once a year, right? The doctor tells you, yeah, everything's good, or no, we need to do some more testing to figure this out. And it's really driven by the insurance, and the insurance wants to keep the cost down because being proactive <coughs> about your health or the health of your car is a lot less expensive than being reactive and finding out afterwards. You know, a, a broken bone or broken leg is a lot more expensive to take care of than a small sprain or something like that. So in the car repair world, you know, let's say you bring your car in for inspection and your cost of your inspection as it is is a great value. We found a loose wheel bearing, a tie rod that needs to be done, and an alignment, and you're out the door for, say, roughly $800. Let's say there's no inspection program in place. Uh, you save the cost of the inspection, but now all of a sudden that loose wheel bearing has caused a uh, wheel to fall off, done damage to the brakes, bent not only the out inner tie rod, the outer tie rod, and all of a sudden you've gone from an $800 repair to a $1,300 repair. And this is on the premise that we don't have any accidents involved or anything like that. Uh, I was had an interesting case about a year ago where we had looked at a car, we failed it for inspection uh, for a ball joint. They opted not to fix that car uh, and they subsequently drove down the road and about two weeks later got into an accident because that ball joint failed. Totaled the car. The insurance company found in the course of their due diligence that the customer had declined the repairs and they subsequently declined the claim on that car. So we talked about other states that don't have an inspection program and the cost and what we see out there. The representative had alluded to there was really no different differentiation in the claims to the insurance or the safety of those vehicles. But I can rest assured you that I know shops in many of those states with no inspection programs. My average repair ticket is three to four hundred dollars. Their average repair ticket is six to eight hundred dollars. So they're finding these repairs <coughs> during the regular course of service and rather than being proactive and saving money, it's reactive and costing these customers twice as much. So again, the, the, the moral side of me says, let's keep our inspection program the way it is. The financial and business side of me says, bring it on. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Representative Gagney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Weed, who do you represent? Weed Family Automotive here in Concord. Thank you. One second, folks. I'm just making some notes for myself. Representative Trojan, you had your hand up? Yep, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Thank you, question. <coughs> We heard a lot of testimony to, today in a state where we said we're saying that having an annual inspection sticker is a good thing. It makes it safe. I'm hearing a lot of stories, a lot of loose ball joints and wheel bearings. <laughs> Can't say I've ever had that problem in any of my vehicles. So um, I guess the, 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 to get to the crux of the question, you mentioned a customer that came in and had took the car without the uh, passing inspection. Correct. So they they basically left without having a valid sticker. Then is that what happened? That's correct an expired sticker and in that particular case uh, we took the step of documenting the work order saying this vehicle is unsafe to drive and make sure they signed it and everything because we, we don't I can call the police and say this car should be on the road and we've done that in the past uh, but I can't stop them from driving that car thank you thank you sir thank you Chairman Sykes, committee members, I'm Tracy Borbage. I'm the president of New Hampshire Motorcycle Rights Organization. 
Uh, nice to see y'all again, I guess. <laughs> um, I'm going to make it short and sweet. Y'all have seen this quite a few times, our Ride Smart program. Uh, so we are here, or I'm here today in opposition of Bill 1114, representing our organization. We are working currently, as I've told you a couple of times recently, so I don't want to make it long, working with uh, the state of New Hampshire, the state police, um, New Hampshire Automobile Dealers Association, the Riders Trainer, uh, Motorcycle Rider Trainer Education Program and the Highway Safety Department on a Ride Smart Program, which is a motorcycle task force trying to work on the safety here for New Hampshire. I think one of the biggest proponents of that in motorcycle safety is inspections. The biggest thing with motorcycles is tires and brakes. And um, we talk about that when we talk about riding safely. Behaviors are important, and, and as Representative Connolly talked about, obviously how a rider or a driver rides or drives is very important. But we as motorcyclists do not want to be on the road with other motorcyclists or other vehicles that are not safe. And honestly, everybody in here can probably say they are not checking their tires, they're not checking their brakes. Most people do not know how to do that. So as a rider and a driver, both, we do not want to be on the road with other vehicles that are not safe. And we've had meetings the last couple of months over a whole lot of things. Our latest meeting was just on this inspection. And as motorcyclists, we want to be on the road and be with other riders and other drivers who are riding with vehicles who are not going to cause crashes. We want to be proactive in, in, in making an environment where we see less crashes. And I understand that there are states that you know, have inspections and some that don't, and the, the data is, is up and down on all of that. But we want to continue to be proactive in trying to create an environment where there are less crashes. And we believe that inspections will help do that. Thank you. Questions for the... Where is that St. Clair? Put myself right there firing range here. Please do so. Oh, I don't enjoy it though, but <laughs> with you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, no. I, you know I, as a, first of all, I want to I want to state that I do check my tires and I do check my brakes. It's pretty easy to do, especially on a motorcycle. <coughs> but I'm, I'm, I wonder what your thoughts are about knowing that we have literally thousands, if not possibly in the millions, of vehicles and motorcycles coming into our state from these many states that have no inspections. Does that cause you great fear and apprehension when you're on the road? Sorry, so I can speak from, I'm going to speak as Tracy Gorbach, not, uh, not as president. That, that's okay, what I want you okay. to do. It doesn't, it doesn't cause me great fear. It, so is there ever appreh apprehension when I ride in other states? Of course there is. But what I'm trying to do as an organization or as Tracy Gorbach is help our state and our riders and our vehicles be safe. And that's, that's what we're trying to accomplish. And that's why we're doing the task force. And what we're hoping to do, like with that task force to answer your question, is we're, we're starting in New Hampshire. And from that task force, we're going to New England. And hopefully from that task force, I spoke to Captain Haynes today, we're actually hoping to take it throughout the whole country, the task force that we've started here in New Hampshire. So we're hoping to make this bigger than New Hampshire, if that answers your question. Well, well I, did, I just was concerned about, again, about all the vehicles that come into our state as a rider. Okay, so, so thank you. Okay. Anyone else? <coughs> thank you. Thank you. Dan <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, I will be brief. I will do my best not to be repetitive, um, and I will um, I'll move through it quickly. I do want to have uh, hand, hand out copies of my testimony because um, it does have some data and information that I will speak to um, and point to, especially to some of the comments. Um, and questions and concerns um, that have been listed. Um, so again, Dan Bennett, New Hampshire Auto Dealers Association. We represent about 500 businesses in the motor vehicle industry here in New Hampshire. Um, we represent both franchise and independent car, truck, motorcycle, snowmobile, ATV dealers, uh, collision repairers, uh, parts stores. Um, pretty much if it's got an engine and wheels or tracks, we'll take it. 
Uh, so we are a motor vehicle trade association. Um, we have long believed that um, that uh, safe roads is a cornerstone of our association, whether it's uh, this particular issue, uh, whether it's um, texting while driving, um, safe roads is, is an important issue for us. Um, obviously, we respectfully uh, oppose HD 114, um, as we have in the past, um, whether it was 06, 08, 09, 11, 15. Uh, every time this issue has been before this committee in the House, um, we have opposed it um, in in any shape or form, um, and that would include uh, the potential for amendment that would even move the program to biannually. Uh, we believe that annual inspections are, are right for uh, New Hampshire folks. You know, the last time this was attempted, it uh, lost 258 to 70. Uh, so the House made, I think, a loud response to their um, belief that this is a good idea. Um, and just to bounce around, all of our neighboring states have inspections, Maine, Mass, New Hampshire, Vermont. So um, I think if we want to address the number of vehicles that are traveling into New Hampshire that are on our roads, uh, those are the ones we see. There's not a whole heck of a lot of Arizona, California plates coming into New Hampshire. But the majority of the traffic, the vehicle in flux LC does in fact come from our neighboring states, which all do have safety inspections. A number of the states that have uh, canceled their safety inspections in the press um, came up, so I'll mention that. And, and again, I apologize for bouncing around, but I don't want to miss anything. I heard about Connecticut um, in the past. We've also had a, heard about New Jersey, um, because those are state-run and administered programs. And the reason for canceling those programs was the cost to the state. We have a very different system. Uh, it's a free market approach. Uh, it's left to small businessmen and entrepreneurs like these folks are some of the ones you've heard from. Uh, the state does not mandate the cost of inspections. Uh, so in those other states, like Connecticut and Jersey, they were state-run facilities with state-set rates, with state operators, uh, uh, staffed by state union employees, so the cost of the state was overwhelming. The New Hampshire approach is very, very different. It is, in fact, a free market approach. You can go to a shop and find a $49.95 um, inspection and you can get a ballot pack coupon in the mail and get one for about 19 bucks so uh, the cost is um, is very very low um, our safety inspection program as it is right now on the vehicle inspection report <coughs> prints out recall data uh, recall safety recall data is incredibly important to both keep the vehicle safe but also have the vehicle repaired by the customer at no cost it is the manufacturer's responsibility to cover that uh, if there's a potential uh, safety recall. Um, so it, it has that opportunity. Um, manufacturers are concerned about cost of ownership, and what they've done is, in fact, they've extended some of those vehicle service cycles out pretty far, 75, 10,000 miles before an, an oil change is done. So because that, the vehicle will see, be seen less time by the shop, um, which means that the potential to miss some of those things covered by warranty or some of those safety failures. Um, that gap is in fact extended, extended. It's not four times a year any longer for some certain manufacturers. Um, I think based on the sponsor's testimony, I think there may, we, we have, um, I guess, uh, data conflict or uh, I don't want to call it data wars, but there, there's definitely different data. Um, we have seen studies from the Institute National, for NHTSA, National Highway Transportation Station Agency. Uh, and the Institute for Public Research. Mechanical defects and or worn equipment on vehicles was a causative or aggregating factor in 12.6% of crashes. Uh, over 850,000 accidents could be avoided. Um, Pennsylvania study in 09 looked at their annual program um, and said crashes because of the program, uh, there's about 115 to 169 crashes uh, that could have saved between 127 and 187 lives. So states that have annual safety inspections have uh, data that show uh, specifically that the program saves lives. Um, we'll talk about, um, <coughs> just real quickly, um, uh, also, and, and to get back to that recall, safety and call, recall, it's important to note that not all vehicles are OV2 tested as well. Okay. Motorcycles aren't OBD2 tested. Vehicles over 20 years aren't OBD2 tested. So we're not um, we're not covering all those vehicles, which uh, will has the potential to in turn uh, cause a revenue issue for the state um, as well. Um, but I, I had this handout, and and I included something, and it's 
it's, it's a winter severity map. Okay, it shows the severity of our winters. Okay, so when we start talking about what other states do, Minnesota, North Dakota, uh, you know, other states, um, it's not apples to apples. Okay, um, there's glimpses of Colorado that get into the red in the mountains and the Rockies. Same thing with California up around Lake Tahoe, but it's not region wide. And if you can see region wide from New England, we are all in the darkest of sectors, which is why we have the uh, most severe winters. Um, and, and so I think when we, when we talk about those other states, we have to be talking about um, apples to apples. Um, we have an incredibly high failure rate in the state. The DMV data shows to it. It's over 15%. It's always hovering around somewhere between 15 to 17%. And I'll mention this when it comes to error data, that that number that's on the, the sheet that I included and uh, maybe the other state agencies will get to. So right now it's at a uh, four, 2019, it was 15.7. That is an at least 15.7, okay? Because take me for instance, I am incredibly loyal to my service station. Um, I trust me, my wife, my, my twin boys it, in their guidance um, and, and I respect their opinion. Um, if they call me and say, hey Danny, your vehicle's got a failure for tires, I don't say, go ahead, fail my car, and then I'll slap some tires on it. I just say slap the tires on it. So my vehicle never gets reported as a fail. It just gets corrected and that's a pass. So that 15.7 is an at least 15.7. So the percentage of vehicles that drive in to service stations in a state of failure, that 230 seconds, uh, that less than the width of a penny for brakes or tires that the gentleman spoke about before um, is the case. So that is, a, that is, that is the floor that is not the ceiling for that failure rate. Um, the last thing that I guess, uh, uh, two last things to point to um, in, in my data, pictures are worth a thousand words, um, and it comes to the enforcement issue. This could be applicability by a technician as to whether the vehicle needs an inspection or not, but more importantly, it's, it comes down to law enforcement. Um, there's a picture of a Subaru wagon there. Okay, got some skier stickers, some little cross stickers, I think, um, or I know. Uh, a couple other things on there, probably some bands. Um, looks like a family car, it's got a trailer hitch. Um, that car is owned by the New Hampshire Auto Dealers Association Workers' Compensation Trust for when I do loss prevention work and environmental compliance in the field. So that is actually a business car, okay? Periodic ski trip, lacrosse practice I'll take my kids to. That is a, per that's, a, that's, a pr that's a commercial vehicle right there. I don't, when that thing's flying down the road with or without a sticker, actually, without a sticker, how is law enforcement going to know that's actually a commercial vehicle? So the enforceability of this, as presented, I think, uh, creates a host of, of compliance um, issues. Um, and then um, the last thing that I'll, that I'll spoke to, I, I believe I heard that crashes um, uh, are going up. Um, but you know, New Hampshire has incredibly low, we're the fourth lowest insurance premium in the, in the nation. And I think that's because we do have um, safe, safer, in better condition vehicles on the road. Better condition, lesser cost to repair. Severity, cost to repair. That's what drives insurance rates. Because our better cars are in better shape, we have uh, lower rates, I believe. Um, and lastly, uh, get back to the comment about crashes going up. In 2019, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety did a stu study about crashes, crashes and crash avoidance because there's so much technology being built into these vehicles. Crashes are going down. Okay? Forward collision warnings reduced crashes by 27%. Uh, blind spot detection, the annoying beeping sound that tells you you're going out of your lane, uh, leads to 14% lane change crashes. Um, rear view cameras. 17% lower backup crashes. So the data points to the higher technology is actually reducing crash numbers, uh, not them going up. So um, just uh, to hit a couple of the bullet points from my testimony, there are some other things on there that I hope you do get the chance um, to look through. Um, and uh, I guess at, the, at that, I will attempt to uh, answer any questions if I may. Just know again, as always, um, we respectfully oppose uh, this bill and the concept of us moving off of an annual inspection cycle, which we think is, is right for New Hampshire 
um, and uh, saving citizens money, but also saving lives. Representative Pine, that has a question if you'll take them. Um, Certainly. Chair, I'll do my best. Um, uh, you don't, in our state, we don't fail people, though, if their back camera is broken or the beeping shift lane device, correct? That has nothing to do with inspections. No, Representative, that's not part of the safety inspection. The safety inspection in statute is about 13 items. Um, when you get down to the rules, the number <coughs> certainly expands, um, you know, well over a few hundred different things that you look for. Uh, statute might say breaks, but in breaks you have rusted, leaking, cracked, rotted, break lines. So uh, there's there's a number of items, but a backup camera is uh, not an inspectable item. I certainly learned to back up by putting my arm over my chair and doing it that way, so. Yeah, yeah thanks Mr. Chair. Uh, just some clarity. A clarification so I can do my research on this when we get out of here. I'm looking at the, the NHTSA uh, statistic of 12.6 percent, only 850,000 accidents. Can you ask or can I ask the plant sponsor his source of the statistic of 2 percent and 44,000 crashes? It seems to be a huge disparity. You can. Uh, the sponsor has said he'll send the data to us though, okay. so we'll have a chance to see it. Okay. In the interest of saving time. Fair enough. Anyone else? But Mr. Rosen, please. Thank you. Um, sir, clarification on you mentioned vehicle inspection uh, and tech recall. Um, I get that with the manufacturer, you go to a, a you know four deal or somebody like that, they don't catch it. They have data on the on the vehicle for that, and indeed they do that whether you get a ticket or not. But what about an independent truck? Recall data. Yeah, thank, thank you for the question, um, and I'm, uh, I'd love to answer it. So, uh, currently, any inspection station in the state of New Hampshire uses what's called an N-host unit. It's offered to the station by Gordon Darby. They're the folks that just won the next five-year contract for the in safety and in emissions inspection um, system and the data management, really, data reporting. On every single inspection, whether it is done by an independent or a franchise dealership, the federal NHTSA database, safercars.gov, is one of those clearing houses for it. A safety inspection, excuse me, a recall, uh, uh, an open recall uh, inspection or audit is done for every single vehicle, then specific. So not just 2015 GMC Acadias, it's Mrs. Bennett's. 2015 GMC Acadia, whether it's done by a franchise or an independent, it's spit out on the bottom of the vehicle inspection report, which is called a VIR, that every customer gets a copy of, and one copy remains on file at the dealership or the, the inspection station. So recall data with our new system by no means is limited to franchise dealerships. It is every single inspection station in the state of New Hampshire, which we have over 1,800. The motto in New Hampshire is no station left behind. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Oh, I'm sorry. Representative St. Clair, you did have your hand up before. Thank you. I, and I have a follow-up, sir. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Um, can you tell me if in the uh, state of New Hampshire went from six months, every six months to be inspected to once a year, uh, what the New Hampshire Automobile Dealers Association, what standing took on that? Uh, I honestly, that, program has probably been repealed for over 30 years um, and I was 14 so I can't, <laughs> so you can't. Right. we've always advocated from our association <coughs> since 1921 one of our cornerstone things we've always advocated for has been safe roads so you're thinking maybe they opposed it um, I'm still my fault, <laughs> I, 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 I can't I, I can't, I can't yes okay so my other my other <coughs> question is is on your sheet you passed out here you made reference to this uh, about the warm weather states that don't compare to New Hampshire uh, climate Arizona California you mentioned several times Florida and you mentioned Colorado which kind of surprises me having lived out there They're pretty good with winters but you also neglected to mention the other winter states uh, you have a question uh, coming I'm going to ask you if okay. what he thinks if, he, if there's a reason for this Michigan. Uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Washington, Oregon, Alaska. Is there a reason that those aren't on, on the shooting? Well, I think when we... Persons? Yeah, so when we... When, and that's the, the reason for the map is to... Uh, you look at the chart that shows the winter severity 
Down here, we've got our red. Up here in the middle, we've got our blue. You look at those states that you mentioned, those Midwestern middle states. They're blue, they're getting a little red. However, but then we go up to New England, clearly blanketed in a red, a much more severe winter than those. So that's not a good thing. Okay, thank you. Data. Yeah. 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 Representative St. Clair, we'll avoid from editorial comments. Uh, yeah, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, thank you, Mr. Bennett. Thank you. Commissioner Bailey, um, first off, what, oh, by the way, collective knowledge up here represents oh, St. Clair is that it was 25 years ago. Pardon me? 25 years ago that we went from six months to one year. Well, I remember it well. Yeah. More, more than that. It was the early, early 80s. Yeah. Just, yeah. Our, our memory was, okay, Commissioner Bailey, my apologies to you. I could not read your handwriting, sir. Oh, so sorry. I did not know that it was you. Who was I considered medical school. school at one point. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do lawyer. like to leave the professional staff until the end, so in case there are lots of questions, um, which is why I sort of made, made you wait. But anyways, thank you for being so patient, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rick Bailey, I'm the Assistant Commissioner at the Department of Safety. Um, we oppose uh, the bill and support the safety inspection program. Um, I will try to not repeat anything. I will focus on the handout that's coming around, which is our New Hampshire statistics for the past three years for primarily why vehicles fail safety inspections. Um, and it's the top five reasons, and we have had a failure rate of around 15 to 16% per year. The important statistics I draw your attention to are brakes. We're getting over 80,000 vehicles a year that fail for brakes. This is not a statistic where someone says, oh, fix my brakes and while you're at it, inspect the car, because that would be reflected a different way. That would be a pass. This is where someone presents their car thinking it's ready for being passed in the inspection, and the inspection station then uh, notifies them that they have brakes that don't pass. So we do about 1.5 million safety inspections a year in the state of New Hampshire. That, of course, is larger than the actual registered population of vehicles because they happen at transfer times. Vehicles come off the road and the vehicles come in. We have about 1.4 million registered vehicles at any one time. Uh, about 300,000 of those are trailers. So about 1.1 million active vehicles at any one time. We think that the safety inspection program works. Um, as we discuss statistics about accidents, one of the things that I would draw your attention to is the fact that a fatal accident gets a great deal of scrutiny. Non-fatal accidents, as a purely practical matter, do not. We average a little over 100 fatal accidents a year. However, there are thousands of reportable accidents. And in New Hampshire, reportable accident is damage over a thousand or personal injury. I'm not talking about the non-reportable accidents, which we really don't know how many there are. Um, so it's hard to say because a, a fender bender on the highway, the concern is get those vehicles, get the treatment for the people, get the vehicles off the road so traffic can continue. Um, there's not a great deal of inspection of the vehicles that may go on. Um, and so we don't know how many accidents these types of equipment failures contribute to, um, unless it's some of the fatal accidents. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Representative St. Clair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Can you tell me if the, uh, going back to when we went from six months to a year, did the department oppose that? I have no idea. That was you know, 40 years ago. We may be able to find out in the uh, record of the committee, but I, I have no idea. Okay, and one quick follow-up, sir. Oh, okay. Sir. You guys, uh, or, sorry, does the department have uh, any concerns about vehicles from these other 30 plus states, whatever it is, coming into our state? Certainly, that's, you, I mean, you've raised a valid point, that there are, are vehicles on our roads that are not subject to these requirements. Um, we feel they put a greater risk but unfortunately, because we don't control interstate commerce, and that travel is certainly part of interstate commerce, that's a regulation at the federal level, and we can't prevent it. 
All we can do is try to make the New Hampshire vehicles as safe as possible. Representative Trude, did you have your hand up? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Statistics certainly can be your friend. Um, other people have said that the 15% failure rate is, a, uh, is an at least. But, on, but on, on your handout, you're saying the deficiency is rejected or corrected. So my question is, when, when, pe when people are doing inspections, and my brakes need to be fixed right now, are they mandated to say that's a failure corrected? I mean, well, yeah, they would, they, if they were in the inspection and they've started the Gordon Diary process <coughs> and getting the results and they just determined that the brakes failed, um, that would be tracked. And then, of course, you don't have to get your corrections made at the station that you're doing the inspection. Uh, some inspections don't have the, some stations don't have the ability to do certain repairs. Um, so a failure could be repaired somewhere else. A correction means it was corrected at that location and then ultimately passed the inspection. Representative Ferocious. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, for taking the question. I heard you say earlier to answer another question that um, uh, you have some concern about vehicles coming from those other 34 states. Do you have any data that would support that concern? No, we don't. I mean, we don't um, track. We haven't done any analysis. I suppose if you went back to accident reports, you could find out how many um, out-of-state registered vehicles. But again, unless it was a fatal, there probably wouldn't be any uh, indication there whether there was an equipment component of the, uh, of the accident or not. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Bailey, your body chassis rust defects data, did we, were we successful in changing the law that said you can have your ugly rusty vehicle but it only is inspectable if it's into the compartment of the car? Well, it's, it's the structural components. There are still some requirements for rust. The um, non-structural components, the, the, the frame of the door may be, may be uh, structural. Um, the center posts certainly are structural, uh, but a small hole in the fender is not structural. And there, that was last session or the session before, um, the legislature made some changes to relieve that from being a failure criteria. So for those economically challenged individuals who probably are like me, riding, driving the rust bucket, um, it might help me a little bit. Not that change? Yes. Uh, certainly. But Anyone it's also else? a warning. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Of course. Anyone else? Representative Peck. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Commissioner, having been involved with the OBD for quite a while since its, 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 its uh, initial uh, going up into effect, how would this affect the contract with Gordon Darby if we were to eliminate inspections? Well, there's a couple of components to that. Um, under the bill, the emissions component would remain. We cannot have um, emission inspections for OBD without the Gordon Darby or similar equipment. Um, the Gordon Darby contract is a little different than many um, because while the uh, State Department of Safety has entered into the contract, we make no payments under this contract. Um, the individual inspection stations make a, uh, an agreement and have the equipment and pay directly to Gordon Darby, and then Gordon Darby provides the state with that portion of the money collected that represents the old sticker fee, if you will. Um, so the equipment would still be there. The cost under the contract would probably be the same. Um, so I, I, I don't know that this bill, as written, would change anything with the contract. I don't believe it would save the inspection stations any money at this point. Well, oh. would, um, <clears throat> would the ability for the inspection stations to print their stickers out now, which obviously they wouldn't have to, I'm trying to figure out how that would work because 
Well, the, you, you the, wouldn't be getting any information from Gordon Darby if, if this was to go away, or would you? I think we'd have to. I think that piece, because it doesn't do away with the inspection, com the uh, emissions component, mm -hmm. I think the Gordon, Ar uh, Gordon Darby infrastructure yeah. and therefore the costs to the inspection stations would have to stay in place. Um, I don't know how we would, if we didn't have a something like a sticker that says this car has passed inspection, I don't know how you'd do inspection. <coughs> Now, maybe it could be a smaller sticker or something, but um, at this point, we just don't see this bill changing any of the Gordon Dark <coughs> infrastructure. Okay. Representative Mr. Chair, thank you again, Commissioner. Um, for those that might not be familiar with Gordon Darby, and I'm not completely familiar, but I believe with other company that administers OBD and all of that. How long is that contract and when is it, when is it renewed again? Uh, it came into place beginning of the year. Um, they did an equipment swap out and it's a five year period. And that, that provides to each inspection station uh, basically a PC on wheels um, where they can plug it into the car to do the OBD inspection. Um, and the terminal they can track the uh, passes and failures on the safety inspection and ultimately print out both the um, vehicle information report and the sticker itself. Yeah, I ask a very quick follow-up. Mr. Chair, very quick follow-up. Follow-up. Okay, thank you. Uh, we heard earlier testimony that um, independent stages can now track vehicle recall. Is that done through the system? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Representative Hargan. Thanks. You've been late, so you didn't get to go to the front like most representatives. Sorry about that. Oh, no, it's okay. Actually, actually, I see that I'm subbing. So tomorrow I'll be, or Thursday I'll be voting in the bills. So I'll keep an open mind during the exact session. But right now, I think I'm opposed to this bill. This bill has come back. This bill has come back before, so I think it's. Oh, you're tearing. Oh, yeah. Um, Okay. Those come back before it. It does. Um, it does mean that motorists have to pay the forty-five dollar fee. You can argue about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for people to be paying fees for services, or whether that's a large fee. But I think that's uh, that's good for the auto repair repair shops. It's good for the uh, motorists because the uh, even though we can argue about what should or should not be inspection, uh, the car that passes inspection is going to be significantly safer than one, and probably cheaper to operate than one that doesn't pass inspection. Um, it does. It's not necessarily a bad thing if it causes people to repair their cars sooner or to repair things that they would put up with otherwise we couldn't pass inspection. Um, there's also um, one th thing here in the new language says um, uh, in the regular course of business. So I, I wasn't here at the beginning, so I don't know what that means. But that seems to me it's going to create problems for a lot of uh, for a lot of people who buy a car or just using it strictly to drive themselves and family around and for some reason um, use it to do business. Um, and also, it's probably going to be harder to get an inspection if most motorists aren't getting an inspection every year. So there'll be fewer shops to go to to get the inspection. It'll probably be, take longer and it'll be more expensive to get it fixed. And also, as a general principle, um, I think the argument against that is a the inspection fee, which whether $45 a lot or not, that's uh, your opinion, but also people do you do more repairs. I think um, there are cases where <coughs> uh, where a car that's still running that I've had to uh, take off the road because it doesn't pass inspection. But I think in general it's a good thing to have people getting more car repairs, driving cars that are better in better condition. And um, so that's I think that's good not just from a safety standpoint, from an economic standpoint. Though I'm certainly I'm uh, I'm a liberal Democrat. I think best which means I'm not opposed to people. Uh, providing services and being paid for them and I know um, so that's uh, I think we should uh, I think we should anyway I think the law if it works is good even though it's frustrating when your car fails inspection so I think we should keep it the way it is so. thank you representative uh, would you take a question if one more sure me yeah all right sure representative thank you thank you representative yeah. I, I'm going to ask you this I have several other people uh, when they changed the law from every six months to be inspected to once a year, uh, knowing that there, you may not know that there's going to be an amendment uh, proposed to make it every other year of inspection. 
So knowing that, were you, uh, my question is, were you opposed to it when it went from every six months to one year? I was in the legislature, though actually my late father was in the legislature. So, uh, my, my no, your opinion, just your opinion as a, as a New Hampshire resident. Um, I think uh, six months is probably, six months is probably too often, but a year is, is reasonable, mm -hmm. whether it's, whether two years is better than one year, but this, the bill uh, as introduced seems to change it from one year to forever, unless you're using your car in the regular course of business. So, so. Okay. Also, somebody buys lots of used cars, I'll say that the presence of the current inspection sticker is um, obviously a good, it's a, it's a signal that the car is at least in uh, minimal, minimal uh, working order, and that's something that a lot of the used cars will have if this is passed. So. Thank you, Representative Warrior. Is there anyone who cares to speak on Bill, um, House Bill 1114 has not had the opportunity to do so? All right, seeing that, can you give us a synopsis of the blue sheet representing St. Clair? Yes, I can. Uh, seven put, uh, put down there in favor of it, obviously against it, and two were in favor of it. Okay, thank you. With that, I'll close the public hearing on House Bill 1114. We reconvene at 1 o'clock. Yes, we do.